So we are on lesson four of our spring quarter, 2023. The title of the lesson is A Worship Scene in Heaven. This also is the title transfer to the earth, which we'll discuss. And that's Revelation chapters four and five. So Lord, we thank you for this glimpse into the future. And uh, we thank you that it is a joyous occasion and um, when the Lord Jesus begins to wrest away the earth from the usurper Satan and uh, we will be there and so we're very excited to to see that come to pass. So we pray that you would guide us as we look at these uh, two chapters and that the Holy Spirit would do its work of illumination that we might understand. In Jesus' name, amen. So the first uh, section is the throne of God. That is verses 1 through 6 of chapter 4. So I will read that. So chapter 4, verse 1. After after these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, Come up here, and I will show you what may, must take place after these things. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was standing in heaven, and one sitting on the throne. And he who was sitting was like a jasper stone and a sardius in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne, like an emerald in appearance. Around the throne were twenty-four thrones, and upon the thrones I saw twenty-four elders sitting, clothed in white garments and golden crowns on their heads. Out from the throne come flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was something like a sea of glass, like crystal. And I'm going to stop there, because that's where the section stops. Okay, so anything to comment on before I pontificate? <laughs> <laughs> it's an amazing scene. Amazing scene. It's an, it is an amazing scene. But notice now it says it starts off after these things. So I didn't mention in our first lesson that Revelation is outlined God himself outlines the book in chapter 1, verse 19. He says, Therefore write the things that you have seen, that is chapter 1, and the things which are, which are chapters 2 and 3, and the things which will take place after these things. So the book is chronological. Not every book in the Bible is chronological. For example, Jeremiah jumps back and forth in time. But this book is chronological, for the most part, and interspersed within the sealed judgments, usually before the sixth, the, all the judgments really, before the last section of judgments, there will be an interlude, and after the last section of judgments, there will be an interlude, and it will explain in more detail what is going on. Much like chapter 2 of Genesis explains in more detail the sixth day of creation. Um, so, But I'll point those out when we get to those things. That'll be through the, uh, the judgments. But anyway, it starts out saying, after these things. That's the Greek metatauta, which means after these things. And so it's after the churches. So this is the beginning of the futuristic portion of the book. What we're looking here, we're transported into the future. And this has not yet happened. We're still waiting for it. So then he hears, he sees a door standing open in heaven. And then he says, the first voice which I heard. So what was the first voice he heard? Really the only voice so far. Yeah, it's um, the Lord's voice from chapter 1. Um, 
the Lord spoke to him in chapter 1, and that's the voice that he heard. It's Jesus' voice. And Jesus' voice says to him, come up here. Okay, now, I, I kind of overlooked the quarterly. The quarterly is a mess <laughs> in Revelation. Okay, and so I... I yeah. No, it's because they enter, they place in there all the different views, and so it's just a confusing total mess. So um, remember, we are interpreting this book the same way we interpret all the books, which is the literal method. And uh, so when you do that, it clarifies things greatly. But this reminds me of First Thessalonians chapter 4. And verse 16, it says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So this cl John clearly is not physically being raptured into heaven here because it says he was in the spirit. So this is a vision. He's seeing a vision. But I think it is a type for the rapture. You know, because what's going to happen in the rapture? The Lord's going to say, "Come up here," and we and and He's going to grab us up, and so you know. And again, the quarterly kind of tries to talk around that and say, "No, it doesn't mean that; it means something else." You know, and they are applied to all sorts of different things. I, I think that is what is being foreshadowed. Is the rapture there? What it will be like? Yeah. And then he says, I will show you what must take place after these things. Again, that's the phrase meta tauta. So it's into the future. So verses 2 and 3, we see who on the throne there. It's the Father, right? And notice how is the Father described. He's described as stones. He's described as colors. He's not described physically. Why? Because God is spirit, right? God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Jesus took on humanity so that we could figure out who God was, right? That's what he said. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. It's hard to relate to something you cannot see or hear or smell or touch. Um, and so there's no physical description given of God the Father here, and that is because God dwells in unapproachable light. And that is 1 Timothy 6.16, said God dwells in unapproachable light. God is, yes, God is separate from his creation. And uh, so then... And it, we're told he was like a jasper stone. There's a lot of similes here. So a simile is going to be a figure of speech. This is not, this is connotative speech, not denotative speech, speech which is literal. Okay, these are figures of speech. It's like a jasper stone. It's like a sardius stone. These are colors. And there's a rainbow around the throne like emerald in appearance. You know, beautiful. And that's what you're seeing, probably bright light with colors on the can, throne. Can you imagine God being? Yeah, yeah, that's what Alex was talking about. It what a what a scene. I mean, unbelievable. Yeah, unbelievable. We will be there, guys. So then, verse four: Around the throne there were twenty-four thrones, and upon the thrones I saw twenty-four elders sitting. Twenty-four elders sitting, clothed in white garments and golden crowns on their heads. So there's this is a controversial area. I gave a sermon on this a couple times ago about who these elders were. You know, the candidates are angels, the elect of all ages, or the church. And uh, <clears throat> I think it can be shown that these this is the church. So the 24 elders, 24 represents the number of, um, is a representative number. It's the same as the priests, that the way David arranged them. 
And that's in First Chronicles 24, verses 7 through 18, which I'm not going to read because we will run out of time. <laughs> but he, uh, he arranged the priests in 24 orders so that they could all have a turn acting in their role because there were so many of them. You know, and think of the church age people from the time when Peter gave his sermon in Acts 2 until today. All the people who have believed and have died are going to be included in the church. Okay, so that's how David, that's how David arranged them. Um, I don't know the significance of it. And the other thing that makes you think this is the church is they are in white garments, which is promised to the church in Revelation 3, verse 5. Yeah, Revelation 3, verse 5, He who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments, and I will not erase his name from the book of life, and I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Yeah, and so, okay, if the, if the Jews, you know, there are righteous Jews, and the reason these are not the Jews or the, right, or the righteous that died before the church age is due to the uh, God's program for resurrection. That is why these cannot be them. And I'll, I'll look at that passage. Um, because this is pre-tribulation. Okay. And the Jews are resurrected post-tribulation. -tri right. And they're part of the church. The crowns of reward, they have golden crowns on their heads. Right. Those are crowns of reward. That's Stephanos in the Greek. It's not diadem. And that is in Revelation 2.10. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you will be tested and you will have tribulation for ten days. Be faithful until death. I will give you the crown of life. So, and that is one of those handouts I gave you are the believer's crowns. These are church-age believers. And these are not for believing alone. These are for being faithful to the, to the Lord. And it tells, you know, one is for leading a disciplined life. In other words, obeying the Lord's commands. You know, none of us do that perfectly, but we should be growing in that as we go on. One is for evangelism, crown of rejoicing. One is for loving the Lord's appearing, just desiring him to come back. He rewards you for that, which is nice, you know, for enduring trials in a godly manner. The Lord will reward you for that with a crown, and then for shepherding God's flock. And I would say discipleship of any kind would be included in that. So so these people are crowned with these crowns, and um, and they're enthroned. Okay, and they're also given the title of elders. Well, we see that in First Timothy three verse two, elders, and First Peter five verse one. They're church age, and yes, I know that the Jews have elders also, <laughs> because I I knew that was coming. <laughs> but again, <clears throat> yeah, no. But again, the the reason this is the church and not the pre-church righteous is because of God's program of resurrection. Well, see, part of the problem is it's not that it's not that yeah, no, the, the church are all people who have accepted the Jewish Messiah when national Israel rejected him. From Acts verse two from Acts chapter two until today. And until the rapture. That that is the church. And the church and Israel have different programs. We, the church exists in between Daniel week 69 and Daniel week 70, the 70-week 70 prophecy. The entire church age is placed between the second to the last week and the last week of Daniel's prophecy. So, um, so then this is the reason why it's not the uh, Old Testament saints. This is Daniel 12, verses 1 and 2. So this is the angel speaking to Daniel. Now at that time, Michael, 
the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people, that's over Israel, will arise. And there will be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. Now what could that be? That's the tribulation, right? And at that time your people, everyone who is found written in the book, will be rescued. That's when Jesus comes. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, these to everlasting life, but the others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. So, now there's a thousand years between everlasting life and everlasting contempt, and we learned that in Revelation chapter 20. But, so the righteous Jews and the, uh, you know, the righteous Gentiles that are pre-church will be resurrected at the beginning of the millennium. So then verse 5 is, Out from the throne come, see this sounds cool, Out from the throne come flashes of lightning, sounds and peals of thunder. It, as long as you know you're not going to be blown up. <laughs> this sounds cool. It sounds like it sounds like a fireworks show. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Exactly. So out from the throne come flashes of lightning, sounds, and peals of thunder. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, and then it's interpreted, which are the seven spirits of God. We saw that before. And then before the throne, something like a sea of glass, like crystal. So that's the setting. Okay, now, section B, the worship of God, and we're going to read about angels. Does somebody want to read the end of verse 6 through verse 11? Amen, sister. Yeah, so that's great stuff, man. So verse 6b, in verse 6a we saw that there was a sea of glass, like crystal before the throne. Then in the center and around the throne, four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. Now what are these? They are not animals that we uh, have experience with, are they? No. So now this is where the, this is where the cord really starts to go everywhere. And actually, John Welford, I was reading John Welford's uh, commentary about this, and he said that some say that these could represent God's attributes. Now, is there anything in this that makes you think that this is these are figures of speech? I, I can't find anything. No, I don't think these are figures of speech. So I think that we should interpret those literally. Um, so even John, the great John Wolverd, you know, that requires departing from literal interpretation to do that. Nothing in the text indicates these are symbols. So, but, and they are full of eyes. They can see it all. And we see these things in the Old Testament. So Ezekiel 1. Ezekiel chapter 1 is pretty cool. I used to read that to my son. And because it, it was cool, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, so anyway, Ezekiel 1, verses 5 through 10, it says, this is talking about the vision that uh, Ezekiel saw. Within it were four figures. Well, I'll start with verse 4. As I looked, behold, a storm wind was coming from the north, a great cloud with fire flashing forth continually and a bright light around it. And in its midst, something like glowing metal in the midst of the fire. So that's a simile there. Within it, there were figures resembling four living beings. And this was their appearance. They had human form. Each of them had four faces and four wings. Their legs were straight and their feet were like calves, were like a calf's foot. And they gleamed like burnished bronze. Under their wings, on their four sides, were human hands. As for the faces and wings of the four of them, their wings touched one another. Their faces did not turn when they moved. Each went straight forward. As for the form of their faces, each had the face of a man. 
All four had the face of a lion on the right and the face of a bull on the left, and all four had the face of an eagle. Yeah, it's something that we don't have experience with. Yeah. So did you know that it called them four living beings? Right. That's what it calls them here in Revelation. In the descriptions, obviously. No, no. Yeah, the descriptions are wild. Yeah. So, so confused. Now in Ezekiel chapter 10 and uh, verse 20, it says, These are the living beings. Four living beings, just like in Revelation, that I saw beneath the God of Israel by the river Kibar, so I knew that they were cherubim. So, so it, you know, Ezekiel seems to be naming these, they're called four living beings in Revelation. Here they're called four living beings, and Ezekiel names them as cherubim. Remember, Satan was cherubim. There is a cherubim. He was the highest cherubim, the anointed cherub that covers, from Ezekiel 28. And he thought he was so great that he could be God himself. He says, I can do that. Yeah. And, thus, and thus came disaster. <laughs> yeah, thus came disaster. He says, I can do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so in Isaiah 6, 1 through 3, we also see, now in Isaiah 6, 1 through 3, they're called seraphim. Are they the same? I don't know. Are they the same? In Ezekiel, they have four wings. In Revelation, they have six wings. In Isaiah, the seraphim have six wings. In, you know, here they have faces like a calf, face of a man like a flying e eagle and a lion. In one of the Ezekiel passages, one of those faces is the face of a cherub. It's like if they're the same things, they can change their appearance. So I, and I, so this is where I don't know. I don't know. Right. This is where we have to trust God. Yeah. That he, know, there are things that exist that we do not have experience with. Well, the trouble is, is with a non-believer, they only have to understand one thing. They're condemned. Because of their sin of rejecting Jesus. That, that's the, that is the ministry of the Holy Spirit to the unbelieving world. They're condemned. That's all they have to know. They don't have to know anything until they're saved. Then we try to figure this other stuff out. Then we have to try to figure this other stuff out. So, so in verse 7, yeah, we're back in Revelation, verse 7, and it talks about their f different faces. Um, I just want to make a note that the Hebrew word seraph means to burn completely. And there's just a ch slight change in the vowel. Seraph means fiery serpent in Hebrew. So, you know, the seraphim are, I guess, like burning ones or something, you know, they're to burn. Um, the word seraph means burn. I don't know. I, I, that's what I'm saying. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to describe them, and they're hard to describe. But um, these are angels, and they their purpose we see from this, is to lead worship. That's one of their purposes, anyway. Then verse 8, And the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, so that is like the, cherif, the seraphim, excuse me, and they're full of eyes around and within. And we saw that in the Ezekiel passages, too. In the Ezekiel passages, the angels had eyes all over them, and there were wheels associated with them also. And the wheels had eyes. So it's uh, it's hard to grasp. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to grasp, and so that's where we just have to take God's word for it. Okay. So verse 8, um, it says, Day and night they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. 
song. I love that song. And uh, so, holy, holy, holy. You know, there's three members of the Trinity, three personages in the single God. All of them are holy, 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 holy. They're also worshiping their omnipotence or God's omnipotence. He is the Almighty. Is also worshiping him that he is omnitemporal. You know, we hear omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, those three. But he's also omnitemporal. What does that mean? He is in every time at the same time. That's how he can say things that sound like, he says things in the future that sound like they're in the present. That's called... So he can see the future. That, that's right. He the future. That's right. He is outside of time. So um, God is amazing. Yeah. You know, God really is amazing if you think about him. You know, I've heard it said that there is no higher thought that a person can have than the thought of God. Because he is so amazing. He yeah, he cares about us. Cares this amazing person cares about us, yeah. which is amazing. Amazing, yeah. Yeah, he has ideas. <laughs> he has good ideas, yeah. Yeah. So in verse 9, And when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, so the, the angels are leading the worship, to him who lives forever and ever, then the 24 elders will fall down. So the angels lead the worship and the elders follow. I haven't heard that. Yeah. Yeah, so now look what the elders are doing here when they fall down. Uh, they fall down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the throne. Okay, so what are they doing with their throne, their crowns? Right. So the crowns are not to build yourself up. The crowns are a tool for worship. That's right. Be yeah, because all the crowns are only awarded if you submit to the Holy Spirit. If you try to do it on your own, there's no crown. He ignores it. Whatever you do in your flesh, he will ignore. So well, the crowns are a recognition that you allowed him to use you in your life. And we tend to keep going back there. Yes. You know, <laughs> yeah. It, it is... Yeah, it is, it is difficult to learn to walk in the Spirit. It is a challenge. So we, we learned that, you know, because we think we can do things. Oh, yeah, I can do stuff, you know. Yeah, so anyway, you know, I mean, following the Lord is a joyous thing, but it's a, it's a, it is a learning process. We have, to, we have to learn how to do it, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So anyway, and the elders are saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things. That's why you're worthy. And because of your will, they existed and were created. You know, if God didn't come up with this idea, you wouldn't exist. I wouldn't exist. All the stuff outside wouldn't exist. <laughs> Time wouldn't exist. You know, uh, that... That's a mind bender. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He decided, I'm going to make something. <laughs> you know, he decided, I'm going to make something. And eternity passed. And uh, what, a, what a, an amazing thing. Glorious. So, um, the, if nothing else, he is worthy of worship just for this. He is the creator. And we are dependent on him. And we will always be so. 
Yeah, he thinks ahead. He yeah. thinks about what you he need, you know. Being organized. Yeah, Dane talked about last week, you know, the Lord put Adam in an already planted garden yeah. that he planted, and with all this food just yeah. brimming. Okay, so anything else about that part? So, you know, we're going to get to see angels in their natural habitat, and that'll be very interesting at some time, you know. Yeah, I do believe that we all have a guardian angel. Yeah. And um, who watches over us, you know. I think that's from Matthew. So section C is the worthiness, the worthiness of the Lamb. And it's, I subtitled this the title transfer. This is the title transfer. So, um, I'll go ahead and read that one, 1 through 10 of chapter 5. I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written inside and on the back. So now we see the Father with a hand. <laughs> so there's a bunch of colored lights and hand because it has to hold the <laughs> has to hold the book. Okay, anyway, sorry. Yeah, I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written inside and on the back, sealed up with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the book or to look into it. Then I began to weep greatly, because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of, out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. When he had taken the book, the twenty-four living creatures, I'm sorry, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain, and purchase for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign in heaven. No, it doesn't say that. And they will reign upon the earth. Yeah. It's not spiritual. Yeah, the kingdom is physical. So verse 1, a sealed book. What is this book? This is, again, where the quarterly goes everywhere. It goes absolutely everywhere, and I'll admit it's not. This is a challenging uh, passage to deal with. Um, I would say this is the purchase deed of the earth, and there are parallels with Israel's land redemption plan. You know, Israel had a redemption plan for land in the Old Testament in the law. It told you if you got so poor that you lost your land, you had to sell it a way to redeem it so you could get it back. If you couldn't redeem it in time, in the 50-year mark, the Jubilee would redeem it back to your family. But um, So Jesus acts the part of the kinsman redeemer for the earth. The kinsman redeemer is someone who is more wealthy, a, a relative of yours, who is able to purchase the land back. Yeah, Yeah, like Boaz was. <clears throat> and sometimes the land can be purchased back by yours, by you. You have the title deed, and yet uh, someone is squatting on the land and needs to be removed. Satan is the squatter. Yeah, how do we know Satan is the squatter? We know Satan is the squatter from Matthew 4. Yeah, Satan does not have the title deed, does he? The God, the Father, is holding it in his hand. So when Jesus was being tempted, Matthew 4, verse 8, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. 
And he said to him, All these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Jesus said, That's not yours to give. No, he did not say that. (laughs) Yeah, he did not say that because Adam and Eve at the beginning pledged allegiance to Satan. And he has been ruling this world since. And so that is what the tribulation is for, part of what it's for. The other part of it's for is to convert the Jewish nation, is to convert the Jewish nation through all these tribulations. Uh, But the other part of it is to pry Satan's fingers off what is not his. Because, and there's an example of proleptic speech in here, which I, I will point out to you when we get there. Anyway, if you want to, you know, I didn't come up with all this stuff on my own. I, I want you to know, but I, I have a. That's yeah, I, well, I have been reading. There, there's a very good book. It's on the rapture of the church, and it's it talks about this title, this uh, scroll in Revelation chapter five. The author's name is Renald Showers, and the name of the book is Maranatha. Our Lord Come. It's a really good book. Showers, like an April shower? Yeah, Showers. Renald is R-E-N-A-L-D. He was with the Friends of Israel for many years. He's passed away now. But it's a really good book. Uh, Our Lord Come. Our Lord, Maranatha, Our Lord Come. Maranatha is Aramaic for Our Lord Come. Verse 2, and I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? So, worthy. Now, how do you become worthy? What are the requirements? Well, first of all, you have to be a man, don't you? You can't be an angel. An angel does not qualify for this. Why? Because man was created initially to rule over this earth. God created man to rule. That's what he told Adam and Eve to do, to multiply, fill the earth, and rule over it. So in order to qualify for this, you have to be human. You cannot be angelic. So he has to be a man, and then he has to rule under God's will. And that is what, and God gave the first Adam a little test, and it was a pretty easy test. He says, have babies. He told him, have babies. You know, you're a nice couple here, have babies. This is all food for you. Just don't eat this tree, the fruit of this tree. That's all. You know, it's rough having uh, being made in the image of God. Because we choose things. We choose things, you know. So anyway... So those are the requirements. has to be a man, and has to be a man who has demonstrated that he's able to operate under the will of God. So Adam and all his descendants failed due to sin. And now, you know, all of us since Adam have had a little bit of a, you know, handicap because we were born with a nature that is prone to sin. We are born with a nature that is anti-God when we show up. On planet Earth, <laughs> we're anti. We are anti God when we show up. So, um, so Jesus is the last Adam. We have the first Adam. We have the last Adam. We don't have the second Adam. We only have the first Adam and the last Adam. Jesus is the last Adam. So, in Jesus, humanity can be redeemed and made worthy of this. It is due to his obedience and sacrifice. And that is 1 Corinthians 15, chapter 45, which says, So also it is written, The first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Okay? Jesus is a life-giving spirit. And uh, he transfers that to us at the point of belief. The Holy Spirit in the new nature, he transfers that to us. And so we have the righteousness of God on our account. 
and that is permanent. And so in him, we are worthy. You know, in him. So verse 4, so why does John weep? I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. See, John has a disadvantage here. Remember, he is transported into the future. We have a great advantage over the prophets because we, as time goes along, history focuses. The Bible comes into focus, you know. I mean, how many people 200 years ago when they read the passage about the uh, two witnesses and the whole world seeing them dead in the streets, how would they think that's going to happen? But we know now how that could happen very easily. So, or Israel, after 2,000 years, Israel becoming a state, right. So John is at a disadvantage. So one of these elders, this is going to be a church-age saint in the future, tells him, stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book. And it's seven seals, because John is weeping, because what if the present world could not be fixed? What if no one was worthy to open this title deed? It would stay the way it is. Satan would still be ruling. It would never get better. It would be horrid, <laughs> you know? It would be hopeless. That's why he's weeping. He's weeping because if without Jesus there is no hope at all. So he's weeping. But then he's reassured by the elder and he says, remember, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Jesus is both the lion and the lamb. The lamb was the first coming because he came as a sacrifice. He said in his first coming, I did not come to judge. He didn't come to judge in his first coming. He came to die. In his second coming, he's coming as the lion, and it will be to judge. It will be to judge as the lion. So... This is interesting that he says, Behold the lion of the tribe of Judah. And then when John looked, in verse 6, I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain. So that's not, he, he says, here's the lion of the tribe of Judah. Then he sees a lamb, looks like it was slaughtered. And Jesus says both, you know, which confused the prophets no end because they would get prophecies of these diametrically opposed messiahs, a suffering messiah, and then a conquering and reigning messiah, both. And they're like, and so they made two. <laughs> they had two. Yeah, they had two. So Jesus is amazing in many ways, and that's one. He's both at the same time. So, um, and then he says, which are the, so he has seven horns. Horns in the Bible is power means power. So right yeah, so he has seven horns, which is the completeness. So that is another phrase for omnipotence. He has all power. And seven eyes is for omniscience. He has all knowledge and all. And the seven spirits of God, which has already been interpreted as the Holy Spirit. Yeah, and, the, you know, a parallel passage is Daniel 7. If you want to look at Daniel 7. A few details are filled in here in Revelation 4 and 5, but Daniel 7 is the same view of this title transfer. The Son of Man comes and gets this title from the Father. So then verse 8, when he had taken the book, the 24 living creatures and the 24 elders, the four living creatures, the 24 elders fell down, each one having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. So another symbol, the bowls and the interpretation, the prayers of the saints. So your prayers go to God. You should know that. People should know that. You, when you pray, they do go to God. Yeah. And they sang a new song, Worthy are you to take the book and break its seals. Why? Because you're slain. And you purchase for God with your blood. That's the purchase price. Men from all over the world. And you have made them to be a kingdom and priest to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. So in though in him, we will rule. 
Okay, there's a a uh, textual variant in verse 10. The majority text, so there's a couple of different ways to, uh, the majority text takes the, the greatest number of primary copies and they use that, that's the majority text. And the King James Version uses that, the New King James uses that. The critical text takes the earliest. And that's the NASB. So in the, the critical text, it says, you have made them, third person, to be a kingdom and priest to our God and they, third person. The uh, majority text says us. You have made us to be a kingdom and priest to our God, and we will reign upon the earth. And so um, that is a something that I've tried to figure out, and I'm having a really hard time. Which one of those is right? You know, the majority does, is the majority always right? No, we can see that in our country. <laughs> That's right, we can see that in our country. No, and uh, you know, the 12 tribes, 10 of them were wrong. Two were right, so the majority is not always right. But I think there's enough evidence that those 24 elders are the church without that. Okay, so let me just read this last section. We always run out of time, man. It's terrible. So, uh, verse 11, Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, and the living creatures and the elders... And the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. Myriads is the Greek for 10,000. So that is 100 million plus an undetermined number of thousands of thousands. That's a lot of angels. Saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. That is seven things, which is interesting. And every created thing which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them I heard saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever and the four living creatures kept saying amen and the elders fell down and worshiped Woo, that's cool stuff so anyway Jesus is worthy, and you can see why he's worthy in Philippians 2, verses 6 through 11. Because he made himself humble, and he died. So, Philippians 2, verses 6 and 7. But this is proleptic speech here, guys. Because they're saying it as though it is now. He says... Every created thing which is in heaven and on the earth and under the sea and uh, under and on the sea and all things in them I heard saying, worshiping. Every created thing is that happening? No. No. Yeah, that is not happening today. So what is that? This is called proleptic speech. We are seeing the future. Okay. That's why. Romans 8, 29, and 30 is also proleptic speech. Remember, Romans 8, 29, and 30 talks about the God's work in our salvation. All the stuff he does that we do not even cooperate in. So it says, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called. These whom he called, he also justified, and these whom he justified, he also glorified. That's saying as though it's in the past tense, right? Now, are you glorified? No, you're not glorified. All of us are justified because in the past we were called. We responded to that call in the affirmative, and we were justified. But he is saying as though it was in the past, you were glorified. That is proleptic speech. It is so certain that he can say that it was done in the past when it's not yet happened. Okay? That's what's going on here at the end of Revelation chapter 5. Yeah, that, see, that's what's harder for us to learn. Yeah. So, Lord, we thank you for this uh, 
amazing worship scene, and we look forward to it with bated breath. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>